the competitive 40k network presents art of war strategy and tactics discussions with the best players on the planet and now your host tim penny and the art of war coaches Hello and welcome to The Art of War. I am your uh, returning fabulous host, Tim Penny. I'm joined by my intrepid co-host, John the Boy King Lennon. Welcome back, John. <laughs> hello, hello. Always fun to talk to you today, Tim. You know, I'm, I'm determined to make that stick. Uh, and we are joined today by a special guest, uh, fellow content creator, Adrian Phillips from uh, the Tabletop Titans, I believe. Uh, Adrian, welcome aboard. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Tim. Appreciate it. Uh, Adrian is here because he just absolutely demolished the uh, Hammerhead Major. I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Adrian, that was uh, Hammerhead Games out of Sacramento? Yeah, that's right. All right, excellent. Yeah, I am uh, used to be uh, used to live up there in Sacramento, so it's kind of cool to see the oh, uh, scene cool. growing up there. Yeah, it's been growing uh, a lot the last couple of years. That's awesome, and I believe you, uh, you crushed it with the latest, uh, what I'm hearing on the internet, the latest boogeyman, which is uh, Lucius Mars. So, Adrian, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, well, give us, uh, tell us about a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell us where we can find you and plug yourself, and then let's go ahead and dive into that list. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, my name is Adrian. I'm the, one of the co-hosts at Tabletop Titans, uh, where we do lots of gameplay. We you know we stream three times a week. Uh, we play mostly 40k, a little bit of Age of Sigmar though, and uh, we just really focus on having really fantastic games. Uh, you know, good good friends playing, and uh, really good Warhammer uh, at all levels. Uh, no matter what we're playing, sometimes we'll play things that are less competitive, but really trying to make it a great great game. Um, and so. We talk about tactics on the channel. We have a great, great community. Uh, definitely go in ahead and check that out over at uh, Tabletop Titans on YouTube. Um, so yeah, I <laughs> I am so happy about Admech. Uh, let me tell you, I started them when they first came out uh, playing the War Convocation, uh, which was uh, the monstrosity of that time period. And I loved it. It was so complicated, so powerful, so interesting. And then 8th kind of hit, and they became much less interesting to me. Um, as they got the new models, they became more interesting. And over time, uh, towards the end of, of the edition, they were they were like, okay, they're kind of interesting again. But now, with this new book, oh my god, they're so complicated, they're so mean. I'm really, really excited to be playing my Admech and really dusting them off for the first time. So uh, I guess, yeah, I'll talk a bit about the list, yeah? Yeah, let's hear what, what you got in there. So it's really, I, I, I was... I had a lot of debate between going Lucius or going Mars. Uh, I think they're both really interesting. Uh, but at the end of the day, I decided to go Lucius for a number of reasons. Uh, Lucius, if you're not familiar, gives the uh, plus one armor uh, against damage one, gives the extra three inch range. Uh, they're known for the teleport strat. And then they, of course, have the amazing solar flare, which used to be just like a once per game shunt kind of teleport for a single character. And that was basically just the Necron Veil. Uh, and it's all about utility for me. Like these are all amazing things that can synergize and work in so many ways. And that's really how I like to play Warhammer. I'm a, I'm a tools kind of player. I show up and want to have a bunch of tools to deal with any given situation. So at the end of the day, I was like, this is the one for me to play. And I also uh, happen to have about 80 Skatari in the closet, which let me tell you was never good in any edition previously. It was like, why would you have that many? And lo and behold, the new book comes out and it's incredible. So um, that was one of the main reasons I decided to go with Lucius. And also, uh, I'm just kind of starting to come back to tournaments after you know uh, COVID and everything. So I played just one RTT the weekend before and then jumped straight into this major. And I said I knew I needed to get uh, a lot of practice on one list and just kind of hone that down as soon as possible. So um, yeah, let me walk you guys through it. So it's a single battalion, naturally. Uh, pretty easy to make it work uh, these days with Admech. And uh, I've got three HQs. I've got a Skatari Marshal and two Manipuluses. Uh, the Skatari Marshal is my you know, my true warlord, although everyone has a million traits and everything. Uh, and he's got uh, the uh, Exemplar's Eternity Relic. This gives him basically turns him to a mini captain and a lieutenant for all my Skatari around. And my list is almost all Skatari. Uh, I also give him the warlord trait Programmed Retreat. This is, of course, pick a core Skatari unit with a 9 or any data tether unit, uh, score, uh, core unit on the battlefield, and they can just fall back and shoot, no penalties, no questions asked. Uh, so he's this really, really big core to the army that just gives me this ridiculous flexibility. Um, and then the two manipuluses are really important uh, because they, of course, grant the uh, galvanic field ability, right, which is the extra... Uh, six inches of range, which is now nine inches of range with which, uh, with Lucius, and the extra AP on my, uh, you know, the Radium, the Arc, uh, basically the main Vanguard and Ranger weapons. So two of those 
buffing up a couple of these big squads, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, one of these manipulus has the solar flare, which is that teleporting relic that I uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, he has, I believe it's the artisans, uh, uh, Holy Order upgrade, um, which one gives me a CP regen, incredible. Uh, but it also gives me a fallback and shoot at minus one, uh, fallback and charge, or fallback and shoot at minus one uh, to hit. Now, didn't come up in too many of my games, but we'll, we can talk about that later on. Uh, so that was him. Uh, and uh, the other guy, the other manipulus, was kind of my main manipulus that wasn't likely to kind of teleport himself into danger and uh, would pretty much never die. So he's got a couple things. He's got the incredible. Uh, a Lucius Warlord trait, and this is the uh, Luminescent Blessing, where I can pick a Lucius core unit with a 9, and they just can transhuman for the rest of the turn, or rest of the battle round. Uh, really, really powerful on these big, super cheap blocks. Uh, and then he would take uh, the Raiment of, of the Technomartyr, which is an amazing relic. Uh, it's funny, I when I first went through the book, I kind of skipped over it, because uh, it was like, Raiment of the Technomartyr, you get a 5-up feeling pain. I was like, cool, whatever. But at the very top of the next column, it says, oh, by the way, you can also pick one of your units within, I believe it's six or nine, and they ignore all negative uh, to hit modifiers, which is incredible. Uh, so he's got that, and he has the Holy Order uh, Logi, which also gives me a CP regen on a certain kind of strat, and it uh, lets me grant a unit immunity to minus one, minus two AP. So these guys kind of form the core of the list, right? It's all these million, these million buffs kind of jumping around all over the place, Often going on to one one unit, um, which we'll of course discuss later on. Uh, moving on to troops, I've got two blocks of twenty rangers and two blocks of twenty vanguard. They all have the omni specs, which is ignore light cover, and the enhanced data tether, which again mostly just lets me get access to some of these abilities no matter where I am on the battlefield. So that's the main reason there. Um, and no special weapons except for one unit of rangers has two uh, arc rifles, which is kind of a random tech that I had kind of picked up. Uh, after playing certain matchups. And then, as if I didn't have enough Warlord traits and special rules, I've also given uh, one of the Rangers, ones without the special weapons, uh, the Warlord trait uh, Firepoint Telemetry Cache, which, again, pick a you know Lucius Chorus Guitar within 9, or anywhere on the battlefield if they're Data Tether, and they count as being in light cover. And if they're actually fully on terrain, I don't even think it says you have to have light cover, uh, you just get another plus 1 to your armor save, which, of course, can stack with cover, but it also can work in melee. Uh, so just an incredible buff that I can basically pass anywhere as long as I have that single princeps alive in that 20-man squad. Uh, so that's all the troops. That's 80 infantry right there. Uh, in the elites, I've got 3 by 5 of the infiltrators, Karen infiltrators, with the uh, taser goads. And they're just super cheap, nothing special there. They are just incredible units that can screen out their action monkeys, do all that good stuff. And then I've got a unit of 10 Fulgurite Priests. So these are the staff melee priests that do mortal wounds. And they usually ride around in my Scorpius Dune Rider, which I have uh, one of in this list. Fast Attack, which for me is quickly becoming my favorite slot, uh, is uh, two units of three Iron Strider Ballastari, both with the double Cognus uh, Laz Cannons. So just basically, you know, 12, 12 Dark Lances, essentially. And then a single unit of the Taraxi Sterilizers, uh, which, as a time of writing, they have the insane, um, the amazing strat to be able to pop up at the end of the turn. And um, I'm not Mars, so they're not there to drop down to a bunch of mortal wounds and pop away, but they're there to, in tandem with the infiltrators, just score, you know, all of my all of my secondary points, you know, all the rod or engage or whatever it might be. So it's all that and uh, partridge in a pear tree. That's my list uh, for for the hammerhead major. <laughs> Wow, I honestly thought that you were done, and then you were like, and then the fast attack. Right? I was like, Holy goodness, there's more. It's so um, maddening. <laughs> yeah, wow, that is that is certainly a powerful list. It is not hard to see why you had so much success with it. So, mm -hmm. congratulations on taking down the event. But uh, so let's uh, let's get rolling here. Let's talk about. Let's dive deep into what this list is doing. So, obviously, you are Admech. There are guns in this list. I know <laughs> that you shoot. But walking through just a normal game, what's your What's kind of your plan of attack? Like, how is the army designed to function? What does it look like when it, you know, it unfolds after deployment? Yeah, absolutely. So often I end up setting up pretty centrally. I want to have as many units within uh, six inches of my double manipulus as possible, because all of those buffs have to go in the command phase. So I'm keeping my options open. Um, 
funny enough, more than going first, I really look to being able to deploy first. If there's any enemy infiltrators, units that can deploy up the board, uh, because I really want to be able to deny and screen them as soon as possible. So first off, I'm just trying to drop at least one, if not two of my infiltrators mid mid board to screen off my opponent from getting too close, getting too dangerous. And this also sets up a little spot for me to use my solar flare early game if I get the chance to be aggressive. So deployment usually looks like that. The Ballastari are kind of hanging back out of line of sight. And the marshal is kind of back midfield um, because depending on where my sight lines are, he can kind of sprint to one side or the other and get close to the Ballastari and they can kind of meet him halfway to get the buffs. Um, he mostly babysits them. But uh, so he, yeah, his, his first goal is to be with them. But his second goal is obviously to buff these big squads. Um, although a lot of the time they don't quite need that extra, extra bump. Uh, so that's how deployment generally looks. The Fulgurites are my counter charge, right? They're the kind of odd ones out here, and they are to defend against um, it, tough invuln things that get stuck in combat. They're stuck succubus and things that prevent me from falling back that I have to get through. Death Guard can be super scary with all their mortal wounds. So they're my counter charge unit. That kind of plays in the early game pretty far back until I can kind of clear some space for them to move forwards in their transport and then do a charge. They're the guys that do the dirty job that nobody else wants to do. They always die after they do the thing, but the thing is always kind of critical to the game. Um, and then going into first turn, I I could honestly, you know, first, first turn can be great. I have a very fast army, very aggressive army, but I wouldn't say I'm overly upset if I don't have to go first because the canicles uh, or the doctrine imperatives uh, going at the start of battle round, me and I can say, okay, I'm not going first. I'm going to go ahead and give everyone plus one armor, minus three move. And uh, that's generally fine because they're either upfield or they're teleporting early game. So that's kind of my defensive play. And I almost always set up assuming that I'm not going to go first, uh, especially with the things that are, that are vulnerable, like the Ballastari. Now, if I do go first, though, I go into a really, really aggressive game where uh, more often than I thought, to be honest, I thought I would kind of keep the solar flare in my back pocket but i found it paid off in so many games to just be a bully with it basically take up all of the buffs put them on a single squad and uh just shunt them up the board so that they're on objective across a couple objectives and just uh often ganking something so if it's something that uh is susceptible to vanguard uh with their auto wound strat or if it's susceptible to 80 strength four shots at minus two which well, you know what isn't uh it'll be the rangers and that kind of flip-flops depending so they'll get up there get stuck in and kind of dare my opponent to try to remove them off a the point um and if they get anywhere near close i can pay one command point to auto pass within six of an objective so that kind of sets the tone of them being a bully me moving up with with my uh, the rest of my army and kind of using individual elements to kind of screen out any kind of response. You know, I'm looking for where there are eradicators or plasma inceptors, if you know if there's space marines in that case, or where are the raiders that are going to try to get my ballastaria, and how do I remove those threats as soon as possible? Um, so it it plays very bullish in the beginning, and then it kind of zones out the the opponent. It makes it really hard for them to respond. Um, so that's kind of the overall strategy of the list. Wow. Okay. That sounds really potent, honestly. Um, very interesting, you know, that you're, you know, the way you're working through uh, using the solar flare aggressively. I've seen a lot of different um, philosophies on um, when to use the solar flare. I know some people like getting that turn one advantage, like when they go first with that mech. And then I know I've talked to a lot of people who really like keeping it in the back pocket. And I yep. just see them end the game with a solar flare unspent, but they're like, well, if I needed it, I had it. Right. Exactly. Um, so interesting to hear that, you know, it's been working really well for you going first. And then, um, 80 Skitari as well. I've seen a lot of lists with 60, but uh, you went up to the full 80. I don't know if that's because these people think 60 is better or if it's because <laughs> they needed a couple more weeks to get the last 20 done. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny. I got to admit, I did start with 60. I, I was playing with 60 for a while. I played it in that RTT the weekend before. Um, and then I, I had a unit of... I, I like the Corpus, Corpus Gari. I like the utility that they give. So I actually had a unit of them and just a five-man ranger squad to kind of, you know, run out, you know, if you need to strangle first turn with a throwaway unit or whatever. And then after playing, I was like, you know, it would just be better if this was 20 more Vanguard. <laughs> and uh, just gives me that staying power because, yeah, it's just, it's just clearly better. Um, and, yeah, it, there's just more. There's always more. And I, I use my troops like a blender. Like, I'm going through these guys by the end of the game, there's not much left, I'll be honest, in some matchups. Mm -hmm. well, let's uh, let's talk about that. You did kind of touch on it a little bit, how you, you played a couple of games and you kind of found that, you know, hey, this would be better if this would be troops. Uh, I really want to hear, you know, like when you first saw the new book, how did you go from, you know, cracking off the plastic of your, your book and then uh, looking at your collection to arriving uh, at the, your win at a major? I want to I find more about the journey 
of uh, the genesis of the list and then basically how you went, how to get into your mindset of building that list into something that was successful. Yeah, absolutely. So it was kind of a cool thing. Uh, We had been working on, or I had been working on for the studio, uh, this Dark Mechanicus army. And so, you know, my my admet collection is quite old. You know, like I said, I have all these original models. I didn't even have kind of the second generation. It was same with Brian's. And so we had this Dark Mechanicus kind of army coming into being where it was kind of our excuse to get, you know, all the new stuff, the Raiders, the Flyers, all that stuff. And um, so we had started collect this. So I was like, okay, we have all this other stuff that can supplement what, what, what currently exists. And I had started off playing with a couple of the Flyers. Because the flyers are amazing, they have incredible utility, especially the bombers, which I know you know Singular loves. And I had played with them, and it was a much more like I said, I'm a tools player, right? So I had played with um, a less kind of brutal list, I guess I would say, a less blunt list in some ways. It was like two flyers, ten, unit of ten uh, infiltrators with uh, like Tempercorpia, which is the fight last relic, which looks amazing. All these things are amazing, but at the end of the day. The more I played through it, and I realized just the sheer, like the sheer ability to play the mission of these big blocks of infantry that are super cheap, was just absolutely incredible. And especially thinking about the matchup, you know, I had one of my teammates at this tournament that had a very similar list. It was Lucius, uh, but he had, he had in the end gone with two flyers, which felt kind of like a way to tech into fighting Admech, because in theory you can fly over and do mortal wounds with bombs. But uh, I'm like, I just don't know if that's still worth the utility of, of kind of the rest of the stuff that I put in this list. So kept adding more infantry, uh, dropped, you know, the Dominus and any of the other rerolls because the efficiency of getting the extra AP and extra range uh, ends up being much more valuable than any rerolls I might get from a Dominus. Uh, so that one surprised me, just kind of testing out and realizing I don't need to have all these reroll buffs for my whole army. And... Um, Played around with a couple things, like a single unit of Rust Stalkers, uh, which I had also played at the RTT the weekend before, um, just for uh, just for scramblers, you know, because they were they have the they can get like that two up or one up with Lucius if they're in cover against damage one, and uh, it was a similar sort of thing where I said I like them, but the utility and the flexibility of the infiltrators was much more useful and much more interesting, and so kind of fit them in. I already had the Traxian, so those were helpful. And so it was kind of like honing in on this idea of what do I actually need? How many last cannons do I actually need? Um, and kind of have a tool for each each situation. I, I had been worried about melee armies. I have like no melee in this in this uh, list. And uh, basically I can I can weather things enough. You know, I can put the front line uh and and just soak up. I had played against uh, I was playing against Nick Hayden, uh, Tasty Taste, and he had put 20 gene stealers into my lines turn one and they just bounced because you know i had my vanguard in front minus one strength they're lucius so i'm getting like plus two to my armor at this point and so then i felt okay i don't actually need that much melee in this list um things like witches and stuff that can pin me down that scares me <laughs> yeah, well, we'll definitely uh, touch on that in part two um i want to hear more about uh your your cp management uh so to speak i know there's a lot of a lot of your buffs are from like Warlord traits and command phase benefits. And I've definitely, you know, during tournaments and practice games, uh, during my opponent's command phase, usually when I go use the, uh, the restroom or go grab a drink, come back 20 minutes later as they're finishing up. Uh, but tell me about how you, uh, you budget, uh, your command points. What's your generic strategy before we go into matchups, uh, part two of how you're going to spend your CP, uh, going through game from round to round. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one thing that surprised me is I used my teleportarium uh, once, maybe not at all the whole weekend. Um, again, I just there's so much amazing stuff though, so I ended up not using much CP on that. Um, I invested a lot in the early game because you just get so much out of it later on. A lot of my strats end up being um, you know one CP to uh, auto pass a morale within six inches of an objective, and uh, this is incredibly powerful for when people do kind of burn through so i'm counting on maybe doing that three times in a game um i'm counting on uh one of the things that makes these big units tick is their weapon strats they're just absolutely bonkers right one command point for the vanguard to auto wound on hit rolls of four and the rangers basically getting to double their shots right because it takes their heavy weapons from uh heavy two to rapid fire two and because i'm lucius they have a 39 inch range so half of that is still rapid fire and so I am really balancing that, those because uh, the second one, especially the Rangers, can be very, very expensive. So if possible, if possible, I'm using Vanguard because they cost 
they have literally half the half the cost of CP. Um, but that's a big chunk of the army. Um, and then uh, what's the other one that I often use? Obviously, is the Skatari. Uh, is the um, yeah, both those Skatari. So the sterilizers, jetpack thrust to pick up uh, the unit at the end of the turn, and the uh, infiltrators or just generic Zakarin one to be able to actually go into outflank from a board edge. So I'm counting on spending that several times in a game to just make sure, guarantee I can finish those secondaries. Uh, from there, it's just, I actually somehow still have a fairly decent pool of utility strats. This is what Admech is great at, right? Do I need to snipe a character with uh, the kind of pseudo-smite from the priests? Uh, do I need to uh, have the Balistari do their uh, automatic six-inch uh, advance and shoot stuff? It's all those little kind of utility things that I find I have. I have not a lot, but I have a few, maybe three or four CP to kind of use when I need it. Um, and, and I need to be very, very careful that I don't get too trigger happy with like the Ranger strat in particular, because uh, I could find myself just quickly running out. All right. Well, uh, we did talk a little bit about your uh, your list and how it was developed. I want to hear, um, and if you, you know, if any of this is because of like a certain matchup, you can just kind of give us like a little wink and nod, say, hey, that's for part two. <laughs> sure. But um, during, your, uh, during the event, was there anything that you were, expecting to perform or expecting to be like a real strong workhorse unit and just kind of walked away from the event afterwards and in retrospect just didn't really impress you or uh, didn't quite do what you expected yeah that's a great question um the it's tough to say because okay I'll, I'll say two things one the priests are weird because they solve specific problems um which is kind of matchup dependent um but it also can sometimes feel like they don't have a job you know i remember in some of the games, it's like, well, I need someone to run onto a point that doesn't, and and have them not care about staying next to the manipulus. So, literally, it's going to be the priest because there's I only I have these big chunks of assets at that point in the game. Uh, so they perform kind of oddly. And then the other thing, like I'm getting a lot of flack for saying this. I'm not saying the Rangers and Vanguard are, aren't incredible, but I personally was kind of fine-tuning when to use each against certain target. When to use Vanguard, when to use Rangers. And uh, that's just a personal thing that I was like, I have to do, I have to practice that a lot more. Like knowing what goes into unit of Blade Guard versus what goes into a Raider. How many shots do you split on that? And so that was a thing where there were a couple of times that I kind of just, you know, mentally math wrong. And um, they didn't bounce, but they could have been more efficient. Um, well, so those are the two. Why don't you go ahead and uh, what we're talking about, I'm... Not everyone may know. I've I found out the hard way. But why don't you go ahead and talk us through that uh, Vanguard strat and why it has so many people buzzing? And then when you're done with that, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about some of that math you're talking about. Why you would use Raiders over Vanguard or mm. vice versa? Yeah, absolutely. So the Vanguard strat is uh, to do with the raiding weapons, which normally auto wound on a uh, to hit roll of a six against uh, I believe it's just non vehicles. And uh, the strat for one command point tr makes that ability trigger on a four plus. So, you know, I, one thing I was really excited to face this weekend I didn't was Mortarian because uh, the Vanguard with 20 of them, they have three shots each. Uh, they start only at range 18, which is supposed to be the limiting factor. But again, with the Manipulus, they're going up to uh, like 27 or something. And uh, they're, they're assault. So you can be going extremely fast shooting at that range. They're not rapid fire, so they don't care how far away you are. And uh, so it's going to be 90 shots. Uh, and and essentially, half of those are just going to go straight through an already auto wound. So um, the other weird thing is because the gun is only strength three, the things that hit but don't wound are very likely going to kind of follow through because you're wounding on fives a lot of the time. And if you're running forwards, then you're not next to the marshal. So there's almost, there's little, very little penalty to actually advance them if you're planning on using that strat. Uh, so their deal is they start with no AP and they go to AP one with the uh, Galvan Galvanic field. So you have to be a little bit careful as far as like, okay, you're going to get a bunch of these auto wounds, but they're only AP one. Um, and the Rangers are going to have many, many more, uh, or they're going to have AP two in that case. But they, they, you know, they're mortals as they are. They still have to roll to wound with only strength four. So that was an interesting thing. And I even learned about that kind of the weekend before playing randomly against knights, not to get too much into mac matchups, but thinking about, do you ever need strength five ranger weapons? Because this was the other part that I think um, I could have done better. In the uh, artisan's ability, the first part is that fall back and shoot at minus one or charge, uh, which, like I said, I didn't use at all. But the second part, is plus, give a unit plus one strength with their weapons. And so 
I think knowing when in a game you need to just and say, okay, turn one, this manipulus is going to just sit there for a turn and do this action to get to be able to unlock strength five ranger weapons. I think that's something that is is interesting, kind of moving forwards. Um, so it was always constantly this balance. What am I going to, like? What am I putting into blade guard? What am I putting into these raiders? Um, what am I putting into the death shroud? Um, actually, everything kills the death shroud in this army. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those poor death shrouds. Remember when uh, Death Guard were durable? I Feels know. like it was just this year. It's mm, such bad. Farms remembers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, yeah, fantastic. they're great. Um, yeah, I mean, I love uh, I love that breakdown there. Uh, yeah. yeah, the Vanguard, uh, the Vanguard are one of those things that's uh, a little bit silly, but <laughs> are they potent when they're across the table from you? Oh yeah. Right, so honestly, the the big question on my mind is. Uh, Going forward, what are you feeling with the Admic list? Obviously, it did, it treated you well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, even the things that I don't want to say let you down, but weren't always all-stars, it sounds like you have a solid plan for improving them. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think you're going to be making any changes to the list going forward? Um, I know, uh, you know, maybe you should talk about this. There was an FAQ on the Taraxi. Um, does that uh, at all change how you feel about them? You know, I was debating um, because I, I kind of I figured it was probably going to come. Uh, it felt like a thing that was not necessarily a mistake in the writing, but was clearly a bad idea in the writing. So I figured regardless of intent, it was probably going to get changed. Um, so there's something I'm going to have to play around with because I, I, I love this army is really, really about those secondaries. It looks like an army that just punches you in the face, but, you know, it's really... Uh, it, it's about being able to do that while the rest of the army is, sc- is scoring points. So they might get swapped out for some raiders, some Cerberus raiders, which are great for denying points and scoring in other ways. Um, but other than that, I think I think the list is going to stay largely the same. I need to kind of just get some practice against certain matchups. And uh, the other thing is I think people are going to start learning how to beat this kind of list and start teching into it. It's a thing that you can't really ignore. So... I think it's more so what I'm my latest project is actually making armies that will try to beat this kind of army and uh, kind of go through that that project mentally and figure out what am I really f- afraid of. Right on. Well, you mentioned secondaries and I do want to talk about those in just a moment. But before we dive in, I guess just one last question. Was there anything that hasn't made the cut, maybe a little bit of hobby lag? Was there anything that hasn't made the cut that you wanted to try? Or uh, I know you, you already went through some iterations of the list in that RTT you practiced the week before. Just was there anything on the outside looking in that just hasn't quite hit the table yet? Um, that's a good question. So uh, with this list, I'm feeling relatively solid. I think uh, I've only I have a bunch of raiders and I've only built you know three of them and painted three of them. So I'm interested in more of them. I think they're much more interesting in Mars, but they're a unit that absolutely intrigues me for for their also again their utility and ability to play all the different missions. So. I think I might be playing with them in a more Mar- in a Mars heavy list in the future, um, but yeah, I think yeah they're the one that I'm really interested to see as I actually build them up. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we'll see them on YouTube on some battle reports. Sometime totally. Soon. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's branch into that secondary conversation. You mentioned how important the tracks you were for uh, for playing the mission. Mm. Uh, obviously, they've changed a little bit, but you know, throughout the tournament and uh, any practice games you had, were there any secondaries that were just consistent all stars? You took them almost all the time. Oh yeah, absolutely. So almost every game, I'm taking uh, uh, Richard Bactarius data or Rod, and um, this is of course the new scramblers, right? When you b- basically have to perform an action in each table quarter, more than six inches from any other table quarter, and uh, if you scoring the first one gives you zero, then you get eight, then you get tw- uh, as four, eight, and then twelve points. And um, this was just amazing with between the tracks, yes, but also the Sakarans. Um And this is why I don't feel too unhappy about the changes because truth be told the Sakarans have that amazing strat that is only a little bit worse than the the, the Traxi version and to have two similar strats that are distinctly different but similar it, it, i think it's going to let me kind of fill that gap you know i might have to alternate a bit more which i found in, in a couple of games one of my action monkey kind of uh, infiltrator units was kind of sitting around because the tracks here were kind of just doing their job better but in the future they could actually just do their job and kind of flip-flop scoring so uh that one was absolutely incredible uh retrieve octarius data uh stranglehold i took also almost every single game which is the new dominate so hold you know at least three objectives and more than your opponent um and this one again kind of comes back to those big blobs of vanguard and rangers that can just kind of bully people off the point and um i would kind of offset my army in a bit right so i would basically 
have one really extended flank with the really buffed up unit, kind of keeping them within six, so I can continue to put the buffs if I need to. And then the other half would have, you know, probably still another of the two units just touching onto the objective with just just enough bodies, because even if they don't have all the buffs, they're they're still fairly durable. And uh, kind of having them kind of just hang a bit farther back, so they're not necessarily taking as much of a hit. Uh, and so stranglehold worked really, really well. Um, I think there was maybe one mission where I didn't take it, uh, but those are my go-to's really. Um, is 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 those two, and I like the missions that don't require me to face a particular opponent because uh, that just never works. What surprised me though is I actually took in two games. I took Eradicate the Flash, which is uh, the Mechanicus secondary where. Uh, at the end of each battle round, as long as I have a vehicle alive, and I, uh, as, long, as long as I've killed more, I believe it's infantry or biker, might just be infantry units, then they've killed my uh, vehicles, I score three points. So uh, we'll talk more about matchups later on, but in, in the matchups where they can't reliably kill my vehicles, and I can reliably kill at least a unit of um, infantry, that I max that both times. Um, so... That is one that I definitely was not expecting to go to take into the tournament at all. Uh, and then round one, I was like, I think I have to take this. It kind of fills in the slot I need. And uh, so it was nice to have that utility in a slot that is different than my other two, which I always, always take. What uh, what category is Eradication of the Flesh? Eradication is in the, uh, it's the same as Grind Them Down category. Uh, let's see, I think I have it here. So it's I'm not I'm often not trying to kill more because although I have these big blocks, I do have a few units I want to be able to throw away. Um, let's see, eradication flash, no mercy, no respite. Okay, perfect. So in that while we stand, uh, grind them down, uh, no prisoners category, or uh, to the last, not while we stand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I, I feel you. That's <laughs> a, that is a great category to have a strong secondary because a lot of times we're seeing people build to deny secondaries. And so usually we'll take like engage, we'll take banners, and then we'll get to that third one where like, oh, I don't have a psyker. Let's see what you give up. And you look at the list and your face just kind of drops when you realize that your opponent's list doesn't give up anything. Right. You know, so having that that powerful pocket secondary in that category, I think, is really underrated. Yeah, and that was yeah. definitely something as I kind of played the the admic book in general, not even just with this list, is I realized that in particular is one that you can also design your list around. Um, it can be easily, it can it can be really bad in certain lists, but it can also be really powerful in certain matchups. So uh, I, I, yeah, I found myself. I took that one twice, and I actually took to the last twice in a similar sort of fashion. Can they kill my? My my, my uh, while we stand or my to the last I'm doing the same thing now. Uh, the to the last is my two Ballastara units, and then one of my big blobs. So I would always pick the Rangers that have the Warlord trait, and so they would just kind of hang back. Um, it was whatever unit I felt like I could actually keep at a distance and not have to sacrifice. At the end of the day, I wouldn't like to lose five points on that, but I felt uh, I could at least protect the Ballastari, um if they just had like no tank killing or nothing. Tank killing that I could deal with in the first couple turns and kind of screen out. So that comes back to the idea of like screening out so I can do my own thing at that point. All right. Well, now I was just thinking about it um, and I was wondering, this is a question we don't normally ask on here, but I'll go ahead and uh, just throw it out there, sure. especially with the GW starting to spin up their own events and everything. And then also metas being so different across the region. I want to hear your thoughts about uh, terrain and how this list plays on terrain. It feels like you have a lot of mobility and a lot of ways to reposition. Mm. Um, do you generally prefer, I know a lot of people would just kind of just assume that Admech prefer a lighter board, but I'm kind of wondering that maybe that might not be the case just because you have so many ways to work the angles and really dictate what can be shot back. So uh, let, talk about uh, terrain, uh, the terrain at the event, and then uh, how your list uh, deals with terrain and what you kind of like to see and what you're hoping to see and how that changes your plans. Yeah, absolutely. I loved the terrain at the event, and I just mean just generally. First of all, uh, it was quite dense. We had a big obscuring, uh, or two big obscuring, kind of in the middle of the board, offset from the center. We had a couple in in the back corners, at least, and then depending on, you might have one or two kind of on the sides. And so it was quite dense, big, big pieces of, of obscuring, but they were also not big pieces of, obsc of obscuring where you had to be fully behind this block, where you could just kind of run around the side and shoot them. That's the kind of like really, really tough obscuring to actually play to, but people could kind of tuck in. So it was pretty good terrain, I think. Um, but like you said, I the, this list is fine with it. It's a lot of infantry. And so getting to put a bunch of bodies onto that piece of terrain, a long, true, true line of sight, um, it actually ended up not being a problem. It ended up being a good thing, uh, especially in matchups where my Ballastari need to kill some tanks. And they need to kill a tank without getting shot back. So it really let me play that angle game where I can say, okay, Ballastar, are going to sprint over to this side, 
get this one angle on this plague burst crawler. If I kill that one, nothing else will be able to shoot them back for this turn. And same for who's going to be the buffed up unit of Rangers or Vanguard this turn. They could kind of go out in the open, just dare them to shoot me, and then the other guys kind of fall back, play that angle game, be just on an objective, and be really awkward for someone to kind of get to. So I liked the terrain, and funny enough, it was really dense terrain, uh, which which was cool. I kind of I knew going in it was going to be dense, and uh, I was curious to see how it panned out, but it ended up being perfectly fine and almost almost a good thing, like you said. Awesome. Well, um, John, that is. Uh, do you have any questions? Because I've pretty much reached the end of mine. I guess my last question um, before I hand over to John uh, to wrap us up would be: uh, Have you uh, have you played this list on uh, over on your channel, Tabletop Titans? Are you planning to? Or is it a little little too uh, hot and heavy for that channel? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a very so it's a very oppressive list. Uh, I think once we find something we can that we feel comfortable can play against it and make a, an interesting game to watch, that's a big thing, right? Um, and then the other thing is I have a bunch of painting to do on it still. I uh, I'm really good at getting tournament standard, but then getting channel standard is a whole other level. So. I have a bit more work to do, which I'm looking forward to, actually. I love doing eye lenses. <laughs> totally, totally makes sense. I know a lot of times when I'm bouncing lists off of uh, people, you know, in my play group and in my club and stuff like that, and they'll throw something out there. They're like, I think I'm going to take this to a vet. And my first question I always ask them, like, have you played against new AdMech yet? So right. I think there's a lot of people out there just haven't really experienced the uh, the face melting. Uh, John, John, yeah. did you have any, uh, any uh, further questions for us? Um, you know, I'm struggling to think of one, uh, Adrian. You've been so uh, you've been so thorough in answering everything. Yeah, it's kind of easy. You get to like poke guess, some yeah. holes. Sorry, I know I can just yeah. go on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we love it. Yeah, no, I, I I absolutely love to hear it. Um, honestly, I think my my only question on the list um is the fulgurites, and uh, you know what? Actually, here's one more. Have you ever considered putting an inquisitor in a list? Just because mm. I've been writing some admic lists myself as you know a thought experiment, trying mm-hmm. to figure out how the army works because I I need to figure out how to take it apart. Mm-hmm. And an inquisitor actually feels interesting in there, kind of in that same role as the the fulgurites, where you get some like splash mortals and a little bit of something else when you need something mm-hmm. else other than just face melting. Absolutely. Uh, have you considered one at all? Yes, I very strongly considered it. Um, even even up to that weekend, uh, I hadn't played with it, but. I was like, yeah, you can get just so much utility. You can get those smites in there. Uh, I believe you can get the better invuln if you want to be even more obnoxious. Um, and it's definitely something I want to play around with. Um, it's the classic problem where these units are so great, it's really tough for me to find what to drop. Um, but I, I, I think an Inquisitor is really interesting here. Um, I know that Hertel was having a lot of success before this book with a single Inquisitor. And that was one of the reasons I kind of first started looking at it. Um, just yeah, just for that utility, honestly. So it's definitely something I I'm interested in, in doing. Looking forward, it's just so tough because, as I mentioned with the priests, they get kind of their one turn to do their thing, and it's a big important thing. But unlike these other units, like my Skatari and Rangers and Balistari, that are doing things every single turn, I get less uh, I get less like data points in a way, right? Cool, the priest did or didn't do this thing this game, and it's that one try. As opposed to I get to kind of learn how to play the rangers and vanguard better every single turn for five turns every single game so it's hard to it's much slower to kind of figure out are they doing their job could something be doing it better is an inquisitor more interesting um but it's definitely i got my eyes on him for sure yeah i think one of my favorite things about the inquisitor is it's such deep deep tech because i think a lot of people forgotten about it and Mm -hmm. uh, i believe this is where hertel was really having a lot of his success is it's really good in those matchups where you're having the game before the game of uh, infiltrators and pregame moves and stuff like that because there's a stratagem from Psychic Awakening um, that lets an Inquisitor deep strike or infiltrate, I'm sorry, for one CP. Right. So you just put them fo- a little bit forward and then that actually creates a bubble for your Sicar- Sicarians and your uh, your dogs and everything to push up forward uh, exactly. turn one and really get that momentum. So that's really cool tech. Uh, mm. Good question, John. All right, well, well, unfortunately, that's the last one I had. All right, well, hey, you know what? That's pretty good. We are right at the 40-minute mark, and I am just, like, so excited to talk about matchups because I just, I'm hearing, I'm hearing, Adrian, I'm hearing you talk about your list and just how it was developed and your game plan, your process, and I just, I have had to bite my tongue so many times because I was like, oh, well, tell me about this matchup, tell me about this matchup. You know, I'm sure John felt the same way. Uh, So, listeners, uh, if you... 
uh, want to get more of like this content where we really start to, you know, uh, pick at the brains of some of the best players in the hobby and the tournament scene. Uh, we have plenty of this over in the war room and we have plenty of this over on uh, part two of the podcast and the rest of the podcasts on our network. Uh, so if you are not already, please consider subscribing to the war room, subscribing to the art of war podcast, and you'll get that juicy, juicy uh, top level information of strategy and tactics. And uh, we'll, we'll t- break down, discuss the uh, matchups. So if you are a subscriber, you're about to subscribe. Uh, we'll see you over there. Uh, John, Adrian, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under, where we break down armies and new rules. Theartofwar40k.com. This episode was brought to you by the Competitive 40K Network.